Hello, thank you for having me. Um, okay, let's start. Sorry, I have to start my timer. Time myself, I tend to go overboard. Okay, there we go. So, um, yeah, today, well, when I was in third year, uh, my, like our professor of uh, urban planning pulls a question to, in the beginning of a class asking us what is the largest informal settlement in Cairo. So we proceeded to name the largest, naturally, the largest uh, squatter settlements in Cairo, in Sheikh Nasser, Azbet al Arab, all of these. And then she kind of like had a smirk on her face, sat back and said, no, actually, it's Nasser City, which was kind of um, interesting because most of the class actually lived in Nasser City. It's one of the largest planned middle class urban settlements in Cairo. So uh, several years later, I wrote a thesis about Nasser City. Uh, part of it examined the dynamics that made Nasser City that large informal settlement that it is. So uh, to understand uh, why it became such, we actually, I actually have to tell you very briefly, hopefully, hopefully um, uh, like the history of the Egyptian middle class. So there was basically no middle class before the like, early 19th century. It started with uh, this guy, Muhammad Ali, who started a, a dynasty in Egypt, um, a very feudal dynasty, and, and to run the agrarian economy that he had installed, he needed a class of well-educated bureaucrats and uh, professionals to do so. And that was the seed of the Egyptian middle class. But because it was a feudal society, there was no chance of social mobility. And for the longest time, it remained a very subdued social stratum. So about like by the 1914, it, was, it only accounted for about 10% of the Egyptian society. And it continued to be so until the 40s, where a very important thing happened. The um, uh, members of the peasant class were allowed to enroll in the army and become officers. And about 10 years later, a group of those officers who hailed from the peasant class staged a coup, uh, which became a revolution. They overthrew the monarchy. And this is where we got Nasser and the, um, well, 20 years of what could be best described as a socialist state-run economy. Um, and this ec economy basically catered in practice to the middle class. Um, and at the height of that, like that um, Nasserist regime, uh, Nasser City was launched. Now, despite, despite the um, inherent vox populi in the socialist rhetoric and like public involvement, there was no involvement whatsoever in the planning of Nasser City from the public. It was just like put there as a statement. It was supposedly was gonna cater to the middle class. And in that sense, it kind of, um, like was very different from anything that came before it. So what you see up there is basically kind of like the higher end middle class residential districts in Cairo up until that point. And the bottom there is Nasser City, which was its own thing, very modernist planning, seemed to like embody again the social equality inherent in like the socialist zeitgeist of the time. Um, but unfortunately, um, this is how, this is just like a very rough planning of how it was supposed to be like its master plan. But right before it actually was like set to like have its urban boom, uh, we had the six day war and the whole economy kind of like tanked and Nasser City remained undeveloped for the longest time for about 20 years, but not before it had become in the collective consciousness of the Egyptian society as the urban hub for the middle class. Um, um, it's also worth noting here that at the time, uh, up until like the Nasser regime came into power, uh, the Egyptian middle class was a very homogenous social like class that had like mostly, mostly made up of well-educated bureaucrats and professionals, and education was its hallmark. And when the when the Nasser regime came over, um, that hallmark became the basis of social hierarchy, basically, and social mobility. If you get an education which was provided through the government, you excel in it, you become a professional, then you're in a good place in society, and you have everything basically set for you. Problem is, after Nasser died, his successor had a mind to shift the economy towards a capitalist um, model. Unfortunately, though, he didn't go all the way, so we ended up with this kind of like simulacrum of we are keeping the socialist rhetoric, we are providing free education and employment, but at the same time, they open up the economy, 
to private and foreign invest investment. And not to go into too much detail, what happened there, two things happened. The Egyptian middle class grew significantly. So although this like, accounts for the Nasser and the Sadat era, um, most of that in huge increase happened past 1975 when that policy was introduced. And the other thing that happened is that society, well, the middle class essentially was split into two classes. Um, the old middle class, the professionals that kept doing what they were doing, getting an education, um, and like trying to like become professionals and get well paid and whatever, and the a new entrepreneurial middle class who basically made um, use of all the kind of like the economic volatility that came because of the open door policy, and they ra rose through the social ranks really quickly, and within that split, how like yeah the the new middle class didn't have the same kind of um, what do you say? Um, characteristics as the old middle class. They didn't, um, like their social, their value system was not the same. And within that context of like that divide, um, something very interesting happened, a phenomenon that I would like to call social emulation. So this is bas basically based on the work of Abraham Maslow and the works of John Bernard. In a nutshell, the new middle class wanted to assert that they are part, that they are now part of the middle class. And because this was a time of like shifting social values, their way of doing that was to out outwardly possess and exhibit the same kind of material goods that the, it's known that the middle class has and use, uses. Um, now, in a consumer society, this is what John Baudrillard was talking about, a consumer good loses, quickly loses its function as such, like a distinct, like a, something that would distinct classes because it's readily available, there's a lot of it. So uh, he identifies habitat, in this case, where you live, as one of the, uh, like the better social signifiers that would tell which class you're from because it's not readily available, there's scarcity for it, and it's far more expensive. And in that context, Nasser City really took off. So this is like the early 90s, 10 years prior to that, there was nothing there. Um, so a lot of the people that lived in Nasser City, because it was at that point the like middle class in the collective consciousness, the middle class hub, residential hub, but it was like the one was like really underdeveloped because it never took off. It became like the main urban attractor for both the middle, the new and the old middle class. The new middle class specifically so because it actually was a very good um, chance for investment because of how like desirable it was, we'll get into that in a minute. But yes, just a quick look at the numbers. So yeah, between, like in the 10 years between 1986 and 96, that was like the height of the urban boom of Nasser City. It had one of the highest annual growth rates in terms of population. And just to like, um, I had to go through a lot to actually prove that because back home, they don't really have those maps. They just have raw numbers. So you have to like factor these things to just, yeah, like prove a point. So it has like, Nasser City has, that's the one marked in red, has one of the highest populations and the dark blue that you see there, that's like, I get, like the highest percentage of professionals living there and giving the high real estate values of Nasser City at that point. Um, it's only safe to assume that the other half of those inhabitants were the entrepreneurial new middle class. Uh, this is when it gets into, like this is where we talk about policies. So this is the building bylaw, the like the official building bylaw for Nasser City for the longest time. You get five stories on all streets and on major streets, five minutes, okay. On major streets, you only get, you get six stories. And it was supposed to be like that, but what happened was quite different. This is a sample of one of the subdivisions of Nasser City. Uh, what you see basically in non-gray, these are all bylaw violating buildings. They are not supposed to be like, they're much higher. And the reason why it was done like that, because there was a high demand for Nasser City. The way, there are like several ways, I'm not getting into, into it right now, but um, basically exploiting the loopholes of the system to break the bylaws and get those buildings grandfathered in, basically. The outcome of which, uh, also, yeah, uh, anything that you see that is gray, there's a, again, looking at uh, um, demographic data, it's a very good chance that it's a, like this, uh, it's a very specific, um, uh, architecture typology, which is an extended family house. 
in an apartment building form. So they're like all parts, like each unit is a nuclear family, but they're all related together. Uh, and again, the first zone, the sample that we're looking at had the highest concentration of that. Problem is like, this is how Nasser City looked like by like the late 90s. Uh, and it, it like naturally it had a very, like took a very big toll on the living quality in Nasser City. And that was around the time when that new urban attractor, a new urban attractor to the east of Nasser City, so same thing, like to the east of the city, came out, that's New Cairo. And again, it was the highest like urban attractor, like even more so than Nasser City. Um, this, however, was manufactured by the government because the government owns the land and they wanted people to move out there. Um, so they created a simulacrum of scarcity. You can't just buy a piece of land over there. You go into a lottery system. Um, and the same dynamic that made the old middle class, uh, the new middle class want to go to Nasser City was now sa the same was happening to the old middle class wanting to go to New Cairo. So you can see the percentage of professionals dropped as well as the ownership there. Um, and that's because at that time, the, um, that's not important, the, um, the social values have shifted more towards the new middle class. So now the old middle class wanted to associate themselves with the new middle class. Uh, but to expedite that position, the government that wa like wanted people to get out of Nasser City, they basically, um, again, legally through policy, they signed the death warrant for Nasser City in 2008 when they passed a universal building bylaw. Uh, that excluded Nasr, uh, the, the suburbs of New Cairo, but basically meant that any building in Nasr City would be 1.5 times the width of the street. So all the by, by law violating buildings became basically grandfathered in, and that started a trend of demolishing the, like the by law abiding buildings to come up with these guys. And this is my personal survey data. So when I, like, that's basically before the passing of the bylaw and after the passing of the bylaw. So as you can see, the numbers just like speak for themselves. Like the, there was a spike in how many buildings were built in Nasser City. It's kind of like a second coming, but the problem is that most of it was, although it's like technically lawful at that point, it was like by Nasser City's um, original bylaws, like in violation of, the, of its building bylaws, which took even more toll because the, the whole district was designed for like the infrastructure for it, for buildings that are five stories high. Um, well, if we're talking about Egypt, we have to talk about the uprising in 2011. I honestly, when that happened, I thought that this was gonna abate because in the aftermath of it, it really showed how the suburbs are far less safe than well-established um, like urban communes like Nasser City. But unfortunately, as it started to stabilize. The trends did not just did not abate. It at best like remained the same, if not like gotten even vigorous, especially with the displacement. So that graph over here that's the most important because like almost no building in the city is being built right now. It's built on like empty like vacant lots. It's basically replacing by law abiding buildings. Um, which brings me to the last point, which is um, a year ago uh, after things stabilized. Um, well, kind of stabilized, a new urban attractor basically has been announced. So it's the same trend happening again. Um, uh, the new capital, which again, the same rhetoric that was when Nasser City introduced, when new Cairo was introduced, was gonna be the hub for the new Egyptian society, uh, for the new government. And at the same time, it seems that like new Cairo right now is poised to what's been happening in Nasser City for the past 10 years, because even though like its bylaws still stand, there's a rising trend in breaking that bylaw and kind of like a way to kind of push people out of it into the new capital. Thank you. Okay.